Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks so that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging on to our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. And I'd just like to go over a couple announcements for you if you have them. If you don't have your bulletin and a handout, please raise your hand and we will make sure that we get you one. But if you notice there's some announcements in the bulletin there. Uh, right after service, please remember we have a potluck and we're going to have the Easter egg hunt. You know, even if you didn't bring food, so what? We have a ton of food. Please join us. I know that everybody has family and places to go today, but please take some time and have some fellowship with us as well. A uh, reminder, there's a sign up in the back about a grief support group that Julie is starting. It starts on April 19th, which is a Friday night. It's going to be held at her house. There's details about it, and uh, please sign up. Julie needs to order some uh, materials for that. If you have any questions about it, please uh, talk to Julie. She'd be more than happy to give you some more information about that. Thursday nights here, we have our Bible studies. We have our adult Bible study, the narrow road that's being taught by Dave and Carol Deloach, and they're doing a great job. It's for all ages, and it's for all levels of spiritual growth and, and desire, um, so I encourage you guys to come join us. And at the same time, at 7 o'clock, we have Pastors Josh and Allison that are leading our, our Illuminate Youth Group, and uh, if you have high schoolers or middle schoolers and you'd like to have them come attend, they have a great time, they laugh, all I know is, is it's, it's hard for us to get our son out of there because he doesn't want to leave, and so um, please join us with that. And then a couple other announcements, we're going to be starting a college group. There'll be more coming about that in terms of specific times and dates, but if you have people that are of college age or interested in helping out Michael Fenske, he's not here with us today, but please talk to him. He would be more than happy to have you guys uh, join him with that. And then if anybody's interested, as you know, we do, we're part of a, um, a inner healing ministry that we partner with a, a, a group called Moriah Ministries. Uh, next weekend, Saturday, Friday and Saturday, they're going to have some training going on. Um, we'll post uh, some information about it on our Facebook page, and we will also be sending out an email about it, some specifics about it. But if you've ever been um, curious or wanted to get involved in an inner healing ministry, um, I encourage you to attend. Uh, we have gone through it, and that's actually kind of how we started the, um, the inner healing ministry here. A great group of people. Um, so if you're interested, there will be more information about that on the website and also Facebook on that. But I do have two questions for you. Did you bring your Bibles today? Yeah. Did you bring your Bibles today? Yeah. If you do not have the Bible, please raise your hand and we will give you one. And if you do not own a Bible, please accept it as a gift from us to you. But more importantly, did you come expecting great things from a great God today? Yeah. Did you come expecting great God, things from a great God today? Yeah. See, I know we're going to see a miracle today, because if I can get through this actual sermon without stumbling and tripping and doing everything I'm doing right now, we're going to be in good shape. But thank you, Jesus. Our God is great, because today, more than any other day, proves exactly how great he is, that he could raise from the dead. He could do, uh, define and deny all of the naysayers who said he couldn't do it. He was a mere human. He showed his power and he showed his glory and he showed his might today and he proved once and for all who exactly was who he was and that's why we come here to celebrate not just on every Sunday but especially today because we get to celebrate just how great our God is amen with that well thank you Jesus well you know we've been doing a series on the signs of Easter and actually if you look at Easter as a whole and if you look at all the signs that we've been studying you can actually call them or put them into different phases of Easter you know, we started out with the preparation phase where Jesus was preparing his apostles for what was going to happen to him. And we learned that he used bread and wine as symbols, as signs, to show them what would happen, but what we would get in return. And that we must invite Jesus into our heart if we were going to have a relationship with him. But as we've been studying over the last couple of weeks, we went through the persecution phase. We learned about the sign of the rooster 
the crown and thorn, the crown of thorns and the cross. How Jesus was persecuted and why he had to be persecuted for our sins so that we could have any hope of a future with him in eternity. So while we've gone through the preparation phase and we've gone through the persecution phase, today we get to learn and celebrate the best phase of all. Because we have already gone per, uh, preparation and persecution, but today is the phase, the prize phase, that we get to receive the prize of all the work that Jesus did here on earth and the reason why he died on the cross so that we could receive the prize with him one day in eternity. Amen? Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Luke chapter 24, we're going to begin in verse 1. As I said, for most of the series, we've been in uh, the, the, the book of Luke because I really like Luke because he gives us information in his, in his versions of Easter that we don't have anywhere else. And so, um, again, as I said, Luke was a doctor, and so he gives us a different perspective, perhaps, than maybe other people have done. So, beginning in Luke, uh, verse, uh, chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Lord, we thank you for your word today, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I just ask that let it be your message and your words that are spoke through my mouth. Lord. Let it touch our hearts, Heavenly Father. Let it draw us to a deeper understanding and a deeper love of who you are. In Jesus' glorious and mighty name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Now, if you can imagine being one of his followers at Easter time, his death and all that he suffered must have brought a, be a big, deep sense of despair and emptiness in their lives. The image and the stories of his beatings, of him hanging from the cross, were probably more than they could handle. In fact, the stories and the images that they saw were probably worse than they could have ever imagined that it would ever be like they had dedicated the last three years of their lives following this man, Jesus, with great expectations that he would become a king, a leader of the earth. And I'm sure not one of them, even though he warned them, not one of them ever imagined that it would end just like this. And in Luke, he says that there were women that were approaching the tomb. And in other versions of this, this scripture, we know that it was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. And imagine what they were thinking about and what was going through their minds as they were approaching the tomb. In fact, in Mark's version of the story, he said that the three women, the women were having a discussion about how on earth would they roll away the stone when they got there. We know that the stone was big, which means it was probably heavy. We know that this stone, because it was so big and heavy, probably was more than one person could possibly roll on their own, no matter how many, no matter how strong they were. But the women in faith still came to the tomb, hoping that they would be able to prepare, that they would be able to anoint the body of their Savior. And imagine their surprise when they walked up and they realized that the problem had already been solved. The stone had been rolled away. And in fact, in Matthew version 28, 2, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. As the women approached the tomb that day, and as they saw that stone rolled away, it brought forth some very startling revelations. The mere fact that the stone had been rolled away was absolutely amazing. The fact that the tomb was empty, quite honestly, was unbelievable. The fact that there were angels waiting was probably a little bit scary. And the fact that Jesus had ridden was absolutely biblical. Jesus had done the impossible. Yes, he had defeated the enemy. Yes, he had defeated sin. But he was not done. In fact, in many ways, that morning, he proved that he was just beginning. They had placed a large stone in front of Jesus' tomb. Maybe they thought to keep him in. Maybe they thought to keep us out. Regardless of the reason, 
They thought the stone made the final statement in the Easter story. If the stone was going to be a barrier between us and Jesus, then Jesus had one more miracle waiting for them. Jesus rolled away the stone for us. No, the stone was not moved so Jesus could get out because there's nothing that has ever been made that can withhold him. But the stone was rolled away so that the woman could get in to testify of his resurrection, to testify to everybody of who he truly was and what he had truly done. The stone was rolled away to prove that there would never be anything else that would prevent us from having a relationship with Jesus. Not a stone, not soldiers, and not our sin. And because of that, there is nothing that will ever prevent us from having a relationship, a true relationship with Jesus Christ. He planned it. He prophesied it. And because of his resurrection, he made sure of it. And isn't it fitting that it would be angels that would tell of his resurrection? Because it was angels that told of his birth 30 some years ago. And I'm sure to some degree the women were kind of disappointed as they walked up to the tomb and they realized his body was gone. And I'm sure to some degree they were actually kind of disappointed that they only saw angels. Imagine when you were expecting to see your Lord and Savior and all you see were angels. And we know that they were scared of him and they said, do not be afraid. Because I'm sure in their eyes and based upon what they had done while he was alive, a dying Jesus was far better than a few live angels in their mind. But continuing in verse 5, it says, Then as they were afraid and bound their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. The angels asked a very simple but powerful question to the ladies that morning. They said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? And that one question should serve as a reminder to all of us that Jesus is not dead. He is not among the dead. Too many times we may worship people and idols here on earth, but each and every one of those will die. Jesus is among the living forever. And we must remember that He is alive, He is our only Savior. He's the only idol, the only God that can ever be worshipped, that will always be alive. In fact, in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. The amen says it all. The amen says it's done. It's finished. It's final. Quite honestly, it was a good question that the angels asked that woman that day. We know earlier in the Easter story, three times, Jesus told his apostles and his followers what happened, what would happen to him. And three times, they forgot. But as the ladies walked to the tomb that day, the stone proved that the tomb was not the end. The stone proved that the tomb was not the end. In fact, the women and the Roman soldiers that morning discovered what Jesus had already known. He was risen. He was alive. He was no longer dead. He was risen not by man or by idols, but by his power. The world had declared his death sentence. But he on that Easter morning declared that he would live and reign forevermore. 
Isn't it interesting the Jewish leaders brought false witnesses to testify against him in his quote-unquote trials. But God brought angels to be the true witnesses. The Jewish leaders had false lies. The angels had God's true and perfect word. That morning, the angels did not speak their own words, but they had been given a very specific and direct message by God. And just as they came years earlier to proclaim his birth, they once again came to proclaim his rebirth, his new birth. In fact, they came to announce and proclaim our birth as well. But there's one thing we must remember about the stones, that stone that Jesus moved that day. That wasn't the first stone he's ever moved, and it certainly won't be the last stone that he moves. In fact, we must remember that the Lord moves stones, not just on Easter Sunday, but those stones and obstacles in our lives. Those stones that we feel are trapping us or preventing us from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those stones that we have tried so many years and so many times to move, but we've had no success. That stone that Easter morning shows that if we allow Jesus to work in our lives, through his power, through his might, he will move our stones. He will move the stones of, of anger. He will move the stones of stubbornness. He will move the stones of fr frustration. He will move the stones of addiction. He will move the stones of fear. In fact, there isn't any stone that our Lord can't move if we, don't, if we allow him to. And what's amazing is the women entered that tomb that morning. What they encountered was peace and joy and love. And if we allow the Lord to move the stones in our heart, He will fill them with the same. He will fill them with His peace. He will fill them with His love, with His patience, with His grace. The Lord has removed every barrier that is preventing us from knowing Him, from having a relationship with Him, from loving Him. But we continue in verse 11, And they remembered His words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. The stone that morning rolled away was the greatest evidence of who Jesus was. They all expected Jesus to be laying in the tomb. They all expected him to be dead. But the stone that morning reminds us that Jesus will never be who we think he should be. Jesus will never be who we think he should be. Jesus will always be our Savior, who we need him to be, not who we want him to be. He will be our healer. He will be our great I am. In fact, there's not any situation or time that he won't be who we need him to be if we allow him to be that. When the women heard from the angels that morning and they saw the empty tomb, they got excited because they remembered. They remembered exactly what Jesus had told them, and that's why in their excitement they ran to tell the others that it was true, it was real. But imagine the apostles as they sat in that room. The eleven who a few days earlier didn't seem to be uh, around when Jesus was persecuted and hung. They were heartbroken. They were distraught. And these women came in to tell them that Jesus was raised from the dead. 
I can understand why they had a hard time believing. There's too much pain. There's too much agony. There was too much fear to truly hear and listen to what the women were saying that day. And sometimes, maybe in our own lives, we are so traumatized by our past or maybe our present that we too have a hard time understanding and believing the Word of God. We want to believe it, but we just can't. Our past pains and our past failures tell us not to believe, even though there's evidence right in front of us to prove us wrong. But in verse 12 it says, But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Peter felt that he had to go to the tomb that morning to see for himself. He had been through so much with Jesus over the last three years that he truly, really wanted to believe what the women were saying. And I'm sure as he ran to the tomb, he marveled and he thought, where is my Lord? Where is my Savior? Where is my Jesus, the Christ? There's so many things that can leave us in awe that sometimes, quite honestly, we get too used to the amazing. Think back how many times, if you watch ESPN, we see all these great sports plays on the highlight reel that if you see too many of them, they become the ordinary. They become the expected. Can you imagine being Peter that morning? He'd been through so much with Jesus. He had seen the sick and injured be healed. He had seen thousands be fed. He had seen storms be calm. And he'd even seen Jesus be transfigured into his Christ-like image. With all that Peter had seen, and with seeing that that stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty, it reminded him to never stop being amazed at Jesus. Never stop being amazed at Jesus. How fitting was it that a few days earlier, when Jesus was on trial, when people asked Peter if he knew Jesus, if he was one of them, he ran from Jesus. But now we see a different Peter, a different attitude. Peter's no longer running, but now he is running to the tomb. He's running back to his Jesus. He looked in and noticed that Jesus was gone, and he remembered. He remembered what Jesus had told him. He remembered the promises that Jesus had made. He remembered that Jesus didn't tell lies, that he always spoke the truth. And I think the story of Peter and the Easter message is just as important as any other story in the Easter message because it proves to us no matter how many times we may run from Jesus, that we can always run back to him. And that he will always be there waiting for us. I said, as I said a few weeks ago, I believe what changed Peter's heart when he heard the rooster crow was the look from Jesus. The look of love. The look of forgiveness. The look of compassion. And that look of charge that he gave Peter. That affirmation that said, you are still my rock. You are still my leader. You are still the one that I have called to lead my church after I'm gone. And it's that same look that Jesus gives us today. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've run, no matter how many times we've denied Him, Jesus is still waiting there for us. Jesus is still there loving us. Jesus is still there forgiving us. Jason, guys, if you want to come on up here. Throughout this Easter message, Luke has taught us some really important things. 
that through the bread and wine that we must invite Jesus into our hearts if we are to have a relationship with him. That through the rooster that we must always remember the words of the Lord and keep them in our heart. The crown of thorns reminded us that Jesus was willing to wear our crowns of sin so that we could wear his crown of righteousness. And at the cross, Luke taught us that paradise is available to all if we repent and have faith. Through the stone, through the scripture of Peter, we are shown that we can always, always come running back to Jesus. Remember, before the story we have of Peter today, the last picture of Peter was him running away from Jesus. Did nothing, I know. Right? <laughs> Church, we may sin, we may betray Jesus, we may walk away from him. But because of Easter, Jesus is always waiting for us, praying for us, that one day we will be reunited. Jesus died and rose so that we may live. Don't die, don't lie up among the dead. Don't go through the empty emotions. Don't be trapped by your frustrations. No longer feel inadequate. Remember in Acts 4.11, it says, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus, on that glorious Easter morning, went from being the rejected stone to the removed stone, to our victorious Savior. We need to be more like the apostles and the women that morning. We need to take Jesus' word to heart. We need to accept his offer of abundant eternal life. We need to trust him. We need to rise up with him. We need to live with him. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, that Easter morning, moved the stone so that we could all get to the Father. And thankfully for us, that stone is still rolled away. And he is still waiting for us. And because he lives, so can you. I think today is a great day to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't have one. I think today is a great day to make a statement, not just publicly, but personally, of who you're going to follow, who you're going to trust, who you're going to believe. I said that this was the prize phase, but church, if we don't receive that prize, then it was for naught. Jesus died for nobody else that day but you. Jesus endured that pain for no other sin but yours. Jesus is waiting for nobody else in heaven but you. So if you do not know Jesus this morning, I'd like to invite you into a personal relationship with him. I'd like to give you the opportunity to enter into that tomb this morning and realize that he is our savior. So as a band plays in the background, I'd like everybody to bow your head. And if you're ready to receive Jesus in your heart right now, I want you to repeat inside. I don't, I don't need you to stand up. I don't need you to raise your hands. The only people that need to know about this is you and Jesus. But if you'd like to repeat silently after me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the prize that we get to claim this Easter morning. Lord, I admit that I've been like Peter. That I have denied you. That I have sinned against you. And that I have walked away from you. But Lord, this Easter morning, I believe that you are my Savior, my Jesus, my Christ. And Lord, this Easter morning, I commit my life to follow you, to honor you, to love you, to glorify you. Lord, thank you that you came, you died, you rose, so that we could be again together forever in paradise. In Jesus' glorious and awesome and wonderful name we pray. Amen. If you said that prayer after worship, I would love for you to come up so we could talk. It's exciting when someone accepts Jesus, but that's when the work really begins. And we want to make sure that we walk alongside you, we support you, we pray with you, we feed you. Because we need a full church, a full kingdom of strong Christians. Amen.
lead us to the cross, Lord. We just lay down all of our sin, all of our failure, Lord. And we leave it at the cross. Lord, we just ask for your forgiveness in any way that we fail. We just thank you, Lord, that we can ask for that forgiveness because of your sacrifice and your son. And always remind us, Lord, that we can return to you anytime we sin, no matter what we've done, Lord. We just give it all to you. Sing, lead me to the cross. Lead me to the cross. Thank you for choosing. 
on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.